American militia colonel Francis Marion, who legend has labeled the Swamp Fox, captured the American imagination. Revered in Americana lore as a heroic Robin Hood type figure who saved American fortunes in South Carolina during the American Revolution. Here, Walt Disney is honoring Marion. In the spring of 1780, when Colonel Francis Marion first came to prominence, America's war for independence seemed all but lost. The Swamp Fox. The birth of the Swamp Fox. The legend is not far from the truth. Marion's daring nighttime attack on a British encampment near Tearcote Swamp in South Carolina on October 25, 1780, is one of dozens of nearly forgotten military engagements in South Carolina which helped change American fortunes during the war. Each day, thousands of motorists pass on nearby I-95, unaware of the skirmish and only the confused motorist, lucky wanderer, or determined historian is likely to see the historical marker commemorating it. This American Revolutionary War skirmish was one of a string of Patriot military victories in South Carolina that highlight the military ingenuity and daring of Colonel Francis Marion. Why is the skirmish important? Because it was one of several audacious attacks that frustrated British designs and moved north, which was the primary British strategy by 1780 for winning the war. We are bringing you this military action as part of our series on South Carolina battles in the American Revolution. More battles were fought in South Carolina than in any other American colony during the war, and the numerous small but important military actions shaped the overall war outcome. Like all of my videos, this is not a lone effort, and without South Carolina Revolutionary War researcher, lecturer, and author Leon Harris, I would be unable to accurately tell this story. Leon has studied this skirmish and has written in more detail on the skirmish. As General George S. Patton wrote, battles were simply an agglomeration of numerous small actions, and this is a perfect descriptive for the military battles, raids, skirmishes, ambushes, and engagements in South Carolina as they shaped the larger war effort ultimately forcing the British from South Carolina and on to surrender months later. Marion's attack and British Legion Commander Bannister Tarleton's failure to catch Marion aptly illustrated the British deficiencies in their southern strategy for winning the war. Marion's victory at Tercoat Swamp forced the British to react, temporarily taking their offensive initiative which militarily is always a key goal, and blunted a British recruiting drive. Marion's bold nighttime raid so startled the British that an outraged Tarleton gave chase for several days through the South Carolina countryside, brush and swamp, to capture or kill Marion. Setting traps all the while, the crafty Marion outwitted Tarleton like a crafty fox. Marion so frustrated Tarleton that in Tarleton's dispatches he invoked Old Testament-like language regarding his coming retribution upon the South Carolina countryside and those who supported the Patriot cause. And that he was to do. It is important to recognize that America's first civil war was not between North and South in 1861. Rather, it was fought during the revolution in South Carolina among neighbors and families, as British favoring Tories and Patriot Whigs competed for recruits and munitions to weight the battlefield calculus in their favor. This conflict removed civil order from the countryside and provoked unbridled violence and retribution. In late 1780, American General Horatio Gates was removed as the Southern commander replaced by General George Washington's choice, Nathaniel Green. News traveled slowly in those days, and it would be almost two months before Green arrived. Meanwhile, two primary Patriot commanders remained in South Carolina, Thomas Sumter and Francis Marion, to carry on the fight. Historian Sean R. Busick writes, Although things looked bad for Americans after Charleston fell, 
Marion's cunning, resourcefulness, and determination helped keep the cause of American independence alive in the South. This map shows the engagements, marked with blue color, that Marion's forces fought, and they were considerable. Note the number of fights at ferries. Ferry points were key terrain along rivers because only with control of a ferry point could a military force move supplies and men across the many rivers bisecting South Carolina. Sumter and Marion had a basic task, stay alive and maintain a fighting force. It wasn't so easy. In the fall of 1780, Marion was worried that many of his men would leave to gather the fall harvest. A second requirement was to feed and arm their forces. It has become an American myth. Such statements as, the American victory over the British army was made possible by the existence of an already armed people. Just about every white male had a gun and could shoot. Well, that just isn't true. Most militiamen recruited for either the Patriot or Loyalist cause did not show up with their own musket or rifle, although Marion's troops did bring their own firelocks. And only about 13% of American households prior to 1850 owned guns. Firelocks were very expensive, a year's or more earnings, and most farmers did not hunt, acquiring their meat from livestock. A third Patriot goal was to prevent Loyalists from gaining strength in numbers. Upon the British seizing Charleston, Sir Henry Clinton issued a proclamation to the southern states demanding loyalty to the crown and forcing southerners to choose sides. This proclamation ultimately backfired and probably brought more recruits to the Patriot cause. Nonetheless, many Tories became firm in their pro-British stance and Sumter and Marion were intent upon wrecking the Tory recruiting campaign. Finally, to succeed, both Marion and Sumter were reliant upon stealth, surprise, and mobility to conduct hit-and-run raids upon British and Loyalist forces, to deplete their manpower, gain much-needed supplies, free captured Whig troops, and keep the revolution alive. Space and freedom of maneuver were two Patriot advantages. Marion was a wily, rough-hewn fighter, who had learned his soldier skills fighting the Cherokee. A colonel, he had commanded the 2nd South Carolina Regiment. His force on any given day ranged from 60 to 200 soldiers, far too few to engage British regulars in fixed battle. The size of his force would fluctuate based upon where the enemy was and what area he was operating. A French Huguenot, Marion's smaller force would have been Huguenot, German, Scotch-Irish, English, African-American, and Mulatto. On October 24, 1780, Marion learned that Lieutenant Colonel Samuel Tynes, commander of the Loyalist Militia of the High Hills of Santee, had Loyalist militiamen along Black River impressing locals to join them. Tynes had been outfitted for an expedition to recruit, arm, and train additional loyalists in the high hills of Santee. Tynes' men, somewhere between 90 and 200, were thought to have a large cache of armaments and supplies procured from the Camden battlefield to arm new militiamen. Marion was told they had bivouacked in the forks of Black River. Marion and 200 of his men about 60 miles away on the 24th, set out on horseback to engage times, not only to take their provisions, but to break up the party before its newly made converts become confirmed. Marion and his force crossed the PD at Ports Ferry, then to Lynch's Creek, present day Lynch's River, and on to Indian Town, where just a month earlier, the British had burnt the Indian Town Presbyterian Church as part of their campaign of burning 50 houses and plantations. Marion and his men kept moving towards Kingstree. Marion and his force then crossed the lower ford of the northern branch of the Black River at Nelson's Plantation, where he met with scouts on the night of the 25th. The crescent moon had already set, so it would have been a dark night for travel, good for stealth and a surprise attack. The scouts confirmed Tyne's force was encamped near Terracote Swamp in the fork of Black River. They also supposedly told Marion 
that the Loyalists had made no preparations for safety. Tynes had apparently neglected to send out patrols, probably imagining that Marion could not make a 60-mile ride so soon. Tyne's men had a big dinner cooked, and Marion's men waited for the right moment to attack, perhaps straining to stifle their laughter as they listened to the Tories, hooping, hallowing, and saying they wished they knew where Marion was, they'd make a riddle of his hide. Their wish became woe when Marion, under the cover of darkness, signaled the attack by firing his pistol, and his men surged forward with shouts and musket fire. The startled enemy could not organize an effective defense, and many, including Tynes, fled for Terracote Swamp. Marion lost not a man, but killed some Tories and broke up the recruiting campaign. Marion's only losses were two horses killed, for which he was more than compensated by the many that were captured, along with saddles and muskets. The Tories who did not make the flight into Terracote Swamp were six killed, 14 wounded, and 23 taken prisoner. Tynes escaped but was soon captured and escaped again after several weeks, but soon resigned his commission after his men deserted him. On the day after the skirmish, Marion withdrew to a secret camp on Snow Island at the conflux of the great P.D. River and Lynch's River. His ranks continued to grow. He hoped his force would be able to protect the plantations north of Santee River from plundering and be able to drive the British out of Georgetown. The British were outraged by Marion's ability to run roughshod in areas they felt were under their control and detoured supply wagons along lengthier routes from Charleston to Camden. Cornwallis was also worried that Tyne's defeat would interfere with British plundering. Several modern books claim that Tarleton was now ordered to hunt down Marion, but such orders and dispatches cannot be found, and a review of the Cornwallis papers, which detail the dispatches between Cornwallis and Tarleton, demonstrate that Cornwallis gave Tarleton great latitude in what operations to conduct. Prepare to charge! Sir, we haven't been given that order. Charge! Charge! Tarleton now set out to kill or capture Marion, and Tarleton's frustration is clear in his dispatches. Both commanders now engaged in a deadly cat and mouse game, with Tarleton trying to lure Marion into a fight. On 5 November, Tarleton wrote to British Colonel Turnbull, the people of the country appear everywhere dark and mysterious, and threatening Old Testament vengeance upon the land. He wrote, I shall proceed to General Richardson's, and if I gain no satisfactory intelligence before I arrive there, I shall destroy country between there and King Street, down to Nelson's, etc., etc. Nothing will serve these people but fire and sword. Tarleton, scouring the countryside, tried for three days to lure Marion into attacking one of his small patrols, which Tarleton would then converge his other patrols onto Marion's overwhelmed force. On November 7th, Marion, with 500 men, was on the verge of taking the bait. A dispatch later from Marion to Gates said that, as Gates had ordered, he had marched to Nelson's Ferry, intending to surprise the British guard there. On learning that Tarleton was at Richardson's with a hundred dragoons and believed to be heading to Nelson's Ferry, Marion decided to ambush him there. After waiting in vain all night, Marion decided to attack and approached within three miles before discovering that Tarleton's force was much larger than his own. Marion, we learn, had been warned off. Tarleton had become aware that a family member of recently deceased Patriot Commander Brigadier General Richard Richardson warned Marion of a trap. (music) 
Tarleton wrote that Marion was warned by some treacherous women, referring to Miss Richardson. Meanwhile, Cornwallis, having received a copy of Tarleton's vengeant dispatch, urged moderation. I am not sanguine to your operations in that country, Cornwallis said. The enemy, I believe, is in no great force, and Marion is cautious and vigilant. If a blow could be struck at any body of the rebels, it might be attended with good consequences. But I do not see any advantage we can derive from a partial destruction of the country. Cornwallis's letter was too late. Tarleton was already trying to lure Marion's smaller force into battle. Marion had eluded trap after trap that Tarleton had set for him, and so Tarleton lost his patience and before dawn on November 8, set off in hot pursuit of Marion's forces. Marion then led Tarleton on a 26-mile chase through trackless swamps and pine tree woods. Marion drew out the pursuit for some seven hours. According to one source, at Bimbo's Ferry on the Black River, Marion began to fell trees in the narrow passageway leading down to the ferry. Meanwhile, Cornwallis abruptly ordered Tarleton to abandon the pursuit and return. An angry, frustrated Tarleton, likely retracing his steps, burned some 30 plantations and houses between Jack's Creek and the High Hills. After abandoning the pursuit, Tarleton, in a letter to Cornwallis dated November 11th, gave the following account of his attempt to trick Marion into battle. I kept my numbers concealed, advanced in the roads, fell back again, showed tokens of fear by leaving camps abruptly and provisions cooked in order to draw the enemy, of whom I could gain no news, either to attack or approach me. I so far deceived Marion that he would certainly have attacked on the 7th instant in the evening had he not been prevented by some treacherous women, Ms. Richardson, etc., with about 400 to 500 men. A prisoner who escaped from him in the night came into my camp just before day on the 8th and informed me that he would have attacked me had he not obtained intelligence of my numbers at Richardson's, but on that account he had altered his route in confusion. Tarleton's failure to catch or kill Marion was a blow to the British and Marion's victory at Terracote Swamp was important for several reasons. First, it was a morale booster for Marion's militia at a time when Marion needed to keep his men motivated to stay with the fight. It boosted the sagging morale of South Carolina patriots whose patience and will had been tested. Secondly, it demonstrated South Carolina Tories would pay a price as well the British recruiting effort would be challenged and many recruits would pay with blood. Of the 23 captured loyalists with the threat of brutal imprisonment and confiscation of their homes and estates, even death, they were suddenly and miraculously astonished and impressed by Marion's troops, resulting in a number of defections to the Patriot cause. Such raids also gained much needed supplies and provisions. After the Battle of Terracote Swamp, the Loyalist movement in the area was temporarily nullified. Marion would continue his hit-and-run tactics for the duration of the war, teaming up and maintaining communications with Nathaniel Greene's Continental Troops, 